thank you. It's great to be here. Have you guys been enjoying the sun the last few days? Of course you have. We tend to have a very sun-centered view of the world. It's understandable. We are solar powered. Plants photosynthesize. They turn the sun's energy into sugars. They become food for animals, which can become food for other animals. It's the circle of life story that we're all intimately familiar with. Today, I'd like to tell you a different story and hopefully make you just a little bit less sun-centric in the process. So let's go on a field trip to the deep sea where there's no sunlight ever. I'd like to show you one of my study sites. Now, our destination is about a mile and a half deep, only accessible by submersible vehicle. This is the famous sub, the Alvin, that I've been lucky enough to use in my own research. Now, the trip to the bottom takes about two hours, and it's cold and claustrophobic and cramped and totally worth it. <laughs> Um, when we get down to the bottom, we see that the sea floor is relatively barren. Animals are few and far between, and that makes sense in the near absence of solar energy. But let's look around a little bit more. I want to show you my favorite environment on the planet, hydrothermal vents. So this is an underwater volcano called a hydrothermal vent, and you can see that it's covered with worms and other living things. And this is far more biomass than could possibly be supported by energy from the sun. When biologists first saw these communities in the 70s, they immediately realized they had to have a totally different energy source. And this shattered that fundamental assumption that all living things were dependent on the sun's energy. It turns out these animals are dependent on microscopic organisms or microbes that can, in these environments, can grow in such densities that you can see them with the naked eye. But what powers these microbes? It's actually chemicals that come out of these volcanoes. So what looks like black smoke is hydrothermal fluid, and it's chock full of chemicals from deep inside the Earth that these microbes use the way that you and I use oxygen and food. And the process of powering life through chemical energy is called chemosynthesis instead of photosynthesis, kind of like using a battery instead of a solar panel. So, Chemosynthesis enables these amazing biological communities to be distributed globally. Each red dot represents a vent field that scientists have visited and studied. And each yellow dot represents a vent field that we have evidence for but have yet to see with our own eyes. Now that's a lot of yellow, right? So even though we've been studying these environments for a few decades now, there are still a lot of really big questions left to answer and some fundamental questions about this chemosynthesis process. So when I started graduate school, I was really curious about how fast chemosynthesis happens in these hydrothermal vents and about what environmental factors make that process happen faster or slower. So we went out to sea and we used the sub Alvin and we collected samples from the sea floor, processed them on board the ship, and we conducted shipboard experiments to measure these rates and determine how fast chemosynthesis happens at different temperatures, temperatures that we would find in these environments. Now, our results actually surprised us. We expected to see something like this, where rates would increase with temperature, more chemosynthesis as it got hot, to a point, and then drop off as temperatures became too hot for those organisms. And this is a pattern that's really typical of most biological reactions. So we were surprised when instead we found the highest rates of chemosynthesis at low temperature, seawater temperature. And that really got us thinking about the importance of these low temperature environments at high temperature hydrothermal vents. Uh, and these are low temperature environments that are easy to overlook when we're focused on these captivating chimneys. So this is one of those chimneys. And you can see that it's surrounded by white patches on the sea floor. And those white patches are low temperature venting environments. And most of that white is microbes that are probably doing a lot of chemosynthesis. Now, I still have a lot of work to do. That's actually my uh, next project deployed on the sea floor. But I studied these microbes to better understand how geological, chemical, and biological factors can influence each other in these amazing environments environments that we know so little about and have so much to teach us. So what might we expect to learn from hydrothermal vents in the future? Quite a lot, actually. 
for better or worse, many of these vent structures sit on top of massive mineral deposits that represent potentially valuable future sources of rare metals that we need for our technological society. Organisms that live in these environments have unique adaptations to high temperatures and toxic chemicals that could potentially provide us with valuable medicines in the future. Hydrothermal fluids regulate aspects of global ocean chemistry, but scientists are still figuring out the precise nature of that regulation. Additionally, hydrothermal vents may be able to teach us something about our own origins. There's some evidence that the first life on Earth evolved at a hydrothermal vent. And finally, if there is life in our solar system beyond Earth, maybe on those icy moons of Saturn and Jupiter, it's probably not photosynthetic. It's probably much more similar to the microbes that I study, at least in terms of its energy source. So the next time you're outside enjoying a beautiful sunny day, I hope that you can stop and close your eyes for just a minute and think about these oases in the cold, dark, deep sea, and think about the light that they can shed on life up here in the sun. Thank you.